Welcome back to the uh, uh, equine anatomy uh, lectures. Uh, continuing on the uh, equine neck, uh, we'll go with the outlines that we started with uh, in the uh, first lecture. Those are the outlines. We talked about the significance. We talked about the muscles of the neck, cervical fascia, and the structures. Uh, now we reach this point. We talked about the superficial and deep uh, cervical fascia and then the structures that each uh, one of them is uh, um, covering or protecting. Uh, so we said that the superficial fascia uh, covers basically this, the superficial muscles of the neck as well as the uh, uh, jugular groove where you do the venipuncture and you put your catheters there. Uh, along with another uh, alternative sites that we also mentioned. And then we moved to the deep fascia, and we said that this deep fascia is a dense connective uh, tissue that's pretty strong, and it wraps around, or it's uh, protecting or uh, covering the uh, uh, three different structures. Uh, number one was the um, uh, carotid sheet. Uh, the other one is the trachea. And the third one is the esophagus. And we've talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, trachea and how we're going to do tracheotomy and tracheostomy or in, the, in the fourth to the sixth uh, trachea rings and talked about the difference between the two surgeries. Also, we've talked about transtracheal wash and bronchoalveolar lavage and uh, also about the, um, the thyroid gland and the uh, 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 cranial deep. Uh, cervical lymph center uh, in the very first uh, few trachea rings. Um, now, uh, in, in this lecture, we're going to continue on the structures and we're going to talk about the esophagus. This is a picture of the esophagus and uh, we, we uh, uh, talked about that before uh, when we said that uh, the esophagus is one of three structures that is wrapped by a deep fascia, which is a dense, regular, connective tissue. Strong, regular, dense, connective tissue. And we said that the superficial as well as the deep cervical fascia communicate with each other and that's very important from a clinical standpoint because an infection in one of the structures that is being protected or covered by the fascia may transmit into other structures so that's that's a very important thing that we need to pay attention to now now let's talk about the esophagus and, and, and its structure and, and um, anatomical features. So first of all, the esophagus is about 125 to 150 centimeter long structure and it has three parts, cervical, thoracic, and abdominal. The cervical part is the longest part which is about 70 centimeters the thoracic part is about 50 centimeters, and the abdominal part is pretty short. It's about 10 to 15 centimeters. Now, a very important feature about the esophagus it's, is its location. It starts dorsal to the trachea. It starts dorsal to the trachea. However, it starts deviating toward the left hand side of the trachea. And it can be seen clearly in the first third of the neck, in the first part of the neck. So if you divide 
the neck into three parts, cranial, middle, and caudal, the esophagus can be seen in the first comma cranial part of the neck. This becomes a very, very important feature when we pass a nasogastric tube or an endoscope in our patients. And I'll explain this later. But for now, please remember that the esophagus starts on the dorsal aspect of the trachea, but it deviates, it moves to the left-hand side of the trachea, especially, especially in the first cranial third of the neck. Now the structures of the esophagus is also is also important. As part of the gastrointestinal tract, it has four layers, a mucosa, submucosa, muscle layers, and instead of the serosa, it has an adventitia. Serosa is the outer most layer. And instead, the esophagus has adventitia instead of the serosa. What's the adventitia? The adventitia is part of the peritoneum, the pleura, the deep fascia. That's very important. And that tells you the importance if an infection affected this structure, which means that it can cause peritonitis, it can cause pleuritis, it can cause pneumonia, pericarditis, and sometimes leading to death of the animal. In addition to the structures, the esophagus is supplied by extremely important blood vessels and nerves, which we must remember during esophageal surgery. The vagus nerve is the, is the main support for, for, for the esophagus. And vessels, we have the carotid, bronchoesophageal branch, and the gastric artery. All of these are very, very important structures, very important structures, vagus, carotid, you have to be very careful when you operate in the esophagus or around it. So let's, let's discuss the important, the clinical importance or the clinical relevance of the, of the esophagus, for example. Passing an nasogastric tube passing a nasogastric tube, the examiner must see the shadow of the esophagus in the first third or half of the neck. You need to see and watch the tube going in the esophagus from underneath the skin you can see that this is very important and if you don't see it then do not push in more you have to stop pull back and adjust your exam and adjust your insertion technique and re introduce the endoscope or the nasogastric tube. It is important 
to see the esophagus and the tube going inside the esophagus on the cranial third or the cranial half of the neck. Very important. This is passing of a nasogastric tube. You can see the fingers are closing the false nostril dorsally, and the nasogastric tube is inserted in the common nasal meatus ventrally. When we introduce the nasogastric tube and we see it coming in the first third or half of the neck, we start blowing some air to basically facilitate introducing the tube further toward the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. When we do that, we find a resistant at the level of the 11th intercostal space. This, indicate, this indicates that the tube reached the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. Therefore, we have to twist the tube after generating a reflux in the horse so the horse can swallow that's why we blow some air so the horse starts to swallow and then the cardiac sphincter can open once the cardiac sphincter is open we twist to overcome the acute angle that's formed between the esophagus and the stomach we twist the tube to overcome this acute angle and then we introduce the tube safely that's how we're going to introduce the nasogastric tube. The main thing is to see it actually on the first third or half of the neck. If we don't see it, don't push it. This is a picture showing the tube inside and the examiner is basically aspirating some of the fluid and the stomach contents to relieve the horse from increased gastric pressure in cases of colic. Some of the clinical cases that affects the Esophagus or stricture formation, diverticula, increase in the lumen, decrease in the lumen is a stricture, diverticula, increase in the, in the lumen, ulcers, and also we're going to be talking about a number of procedures. The most important thing is the fact that the deep fascia, the deep cervical fascia communicate with trachea and with the carotid sheet meaning that if there's any problem with any of these structures and now we are talking about the esophagus if there's a problem with the esophagus for example the infection may go to the esophage to the um, to the trachea or to the carotid sheet Now, esophageal surgery is somehow difficult because you don't have serosa and you have adventitia instead, which, as I mentioned earlier, part of the peritoneum, the pleura, the deep fascia, is very important. And because the lumen of the esophagus is small to start with, any esophageal surgery may cause, may cause post-surgical strictures. That's something needs to be avoided.
Another case is a diverticula or increase in the size of the lumen. And uh, again, there are different different types, traction or pulsion. But, but again, you will you will get to this in in medicine. This is just to show you the the the, the different cases that can affect the esophagus. Sometimes stricture or reduction in the lumen, uh, mainly post surgically, and then um, increase in the lumen uh, as well. Another case is ulcers. This is a case of esophageal ulcer. Uh, this is an endoscopic view uh, showing here the, the ulcer in the, um, in the uh, esophagus. And this can be confirmed uh, with an uh, esophageogram, uh, basically. This is an esophageogram, which basically you let the horse or the human or, or the patient basically uh, swallow uh, some uh, 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 radio-opaque uh, uh, um, liquid and you take a series of radiographs to see that there is a severe decrease in the lumen of the esophagus right here okay of course if there is any decrease in the in the in the luminal side then definitely there are increase um, in the in the luminal uh, size of the esophagus uh, dorsal to that or cranial to that uh, to that stricture it, it's always the case, basically. Uh, basically, the most uh, the, the most common way to diagnose these problems is uh, endoscopy. This is an endoscope, uh, to, pretty commonly used in in practice. Sometimes with an external monitor, sometimes without an external monitor, and uh, this is the way you can open open the uh, strictures, basically. Uh, in, in the esophagus through endoscopy and you, you basically through a ballooning type uh, type procedure that you inflate a balloon here where the stricture is and once the balloon is is, uh, is inflated uh, basically um, the, the, the stricture uh, is, is gone the lumen is basically increased in size uh, another thing is we can use we can use also endoscopy to to remove a foreign body from the esophagus, and this is this is basically the type of of um, endoscopic forceps, if you will, to to grab the, any foreign bodies in the esophagus and and um, uh, pull pull it uh, toward the outside to relieve the pain uh, in, in in the horse. So so these are basically the different cases that affect the um, the um, esophagus. Uh, the most important thing to remember is that it does not have a serosa. It, instead, it has an adventitia. Number one and number two is the fact that uh, it's on the dorsal aspect of the trachea, except on the uh, first uh, uh, cranial third or half of the of the neck. And this must be um, must be uh, utilized when we pass an esophageal tube in the horse or a um, an endoscope. Uh, but then, then we came to the uh, clinical uh, cases of the esophagus, and we talked about stricture and and diverticula and and, uh, and ulcers. So this is basically a um, the 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 facts related to the to the esophagus. Um, now we're going to move to a uh, the lymphatic drainage of the neck.
The cranial deep cervical lymph center is around the thyroid gland. The middle deep cervical lymph center in the middle of the trachea. The caudal deep cervical lymph center is at the thoracic inlet. The thoracic inlet. So we have three deep lymph centers. Now we have also one that is superficial. So for the neck we have a cranial deep cervical lymph center, a middle deep cervical lymph center, and a caudal deep cervical lymph center. Number five, number six, and number seven. In addition to those, we have one superficial cervical lymph center, and that is number eight. So three deep cervical lymph centers, cranial, middle, and caudal, and then one superficial cervical limb center. What are the borders for? I mentioned earlier the location for the cranial, middle, and caudal deep limb centers. They're all along the trachea. One is at the level of the thyroid gland, which is basically the very first um, trachea rings. The middle is in the middle of the trachea, and the caudal is at the thoracic inlet. Now, what are the borders for the superficial cervical lymph center? Laterally, it's covered by the omotransversarius and the cladiomastoideus muscles. Medially, the omohyoideus, and caudally is the subclavius. Laterally, omotransversarius and Clidiomastoideus medially is the omohyoidus and caudally is the subclavius. Let's take a look at the picture uh, that shows this. You've seen this picture when we discussed the muscles of the neck. The superficial cervical limb center is located in this area here. Laterally, you have the omotransversarius and the clidiomastoidus, 13 and 14 respectively here. Medially, you have the omohyoidus, which is the, the same medial border for the jugular groove. You, you cannot see it here completely, but we'll see it in, 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 in the next picture. Uh, and then caudally, number 18 is the subclavius is the subclavius. Let's take a look at the next picture and you will see the center better. This is the lymphatic center, the, the dots here or the little circles and this is the omohyoidus muscle number 10 which forms the medial border for both the jugular groove and also the superficial cervical lymph center. Number 20 20 in this case is the subclavius muscle, which is the caudal border for the superficial cervical lymph center. And then removed is the lateral border, which is the omotransversarius and the clidio mastoidus. These are basically the borders for the a, uh, a superficial cervical lymph center. So we have three deep cervical lymph centers, cranial, middle, and caudal. And we have one superficial cervical lymph center. The three deep are located along the trachea. And the caudal deep is located at the thoracic inlet. Middle deep is in the middle of the trachea. Cranial deep is around the th thyroid gland. Superficial cervical lymph center has three borders, 
Medially is the omohyoideus. Laterally is the omotransversarius and the clidiomastoideus. And caudally is the subclavius muscle. Now, we move to the last discussion point in the neck, and that is the nuchal ligament. The nuchal ligament consists of two parts. A funiculus nuchi, which is number seven, a cord-like structure, and a lamina nuchi, a sheet-like structure, a lamina nuki and a funiculus nuki these are the two parts of the nuchal ligament again to support the heavy head and to uh, support the need for continuous flexibility now The funiculus and nuchi, number seven, consists of two bright yellow cords originating from the back of the skull and extend caudally on the dorsal midline. To join the supraspinous ligament that originates from the sacrum. The two ligaments unite and insert on the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra T2 to T8. The two ligaments unite 
and insert on the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra to to eight. During this union, the supraspinous ligament gives the thoracolumbar fascia. During this union, the supraspinous ligament gives the thoracolumbar fascia laterally of course on each side which releases the dorsoscapular ligament the thoracolumbar fascia releases the dorsoscapular ligament dorsoscapular ligament the dorsoscapular ligament interdigitates with the serratus ventralis in the deep surface of the scapula to support the attachment between the forelimb and the thorax since there is no articulation between the forelimb and the thorax. Now, The lamina nuchi originates from the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra 2 to 3 and the funiculus nuchi and inserts on the spinous processes of the cervical vertebra C2 to C5, C2 to C5. So it originates from the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra 2, 3, and funiculus nuchi, and it inserts on the spinous processes of cervical vertebra 2 to 5. Now, There is a number of clinical significances for the funiculus nuchi. Next time, I will talk about them and also about the cervical vertebra.